Good morning. Good morning. That's to wake you up this morning. Hey, welcome to Alive. It's so good to worship with you this morning, whether you're gathered here in the building or whether you are watching online. Welcome to worship. Welcome from God, our Father, and from His Son, and from His Holy Spirit. And if you have been journeying with Alive for a while now, you will know that our mission is to bring life to community to help people find ways to bring the gospel to their context, to their neighbors, in their schools, in their work, to help people share the love of Jesus Christ. And that could look different depending on where you live and where you're at. It might mean that you are getting, working to get to know your neighbors, inviting them over. It might mean that you're at school looking out for people who are alone and finding ways to be an includer and bring them in. And it can look different depending on where you live across the world. You know, this year, or this, this past week, those of us on staff, we've been working to assess where are ways that all of you can serve here in the church so that we can all work together to bring life to community. And in the coming weeks and months, we're going to be presenting different ways that you can volunteer and help serve here at Alive so that we can build God's kingdom together. And it's also why I'm going to show a video for you in just a moment, which is a testimony from one of a uh, missionary, and his name is Sindhu Pani. And he works, he's the director of the Global India Training Network. And this, this is a ministry that he founded along with his wife, Minnie. And I got to know Sindhu because I met his daughter, named Sharon, who is a, a student at Calvin College, and I was coming alongside her to help her through some things, and through that I got to know Sindhu, and he just shared an incredible testimony about his ministry, and I just wanted to share that with you all this morning. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning from India. My name is Sindhu Pani, and I'm married to Minati, and we have two daughters. They are uh, studying in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, I was born and brought up in a remote village in uh, Orissa, uh, the place called Sarango. And uh, while I was in college, uh, I received Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior while reading through a book called Jesus is the only way. And soon after that, a fire ignited within me to serve the Lord, to preach the gospel into the nook and corner of our Orissa state. So while preaching the gospel, many times I have been beaten by the radical Hindus and fundamentalistic Hindus. And literature, New Testament, gospel packets has been uh, snatched away from my hands and uh, uh, put into the ground and uh, they, they walked over it and they, uh, they destroyed it. And many, many times they have dragged into the clubhouses and humiliated me, harassed me and uh, tortured me. Eventually we sensed the call of God and, uh, and we came back by faith and we began to reach out to the neighborhood and also we began to uh, training and equipping indigenous pastors, church planters and Christian leaders. It was during 2008 and 9, while we were in Orissa, training pastors and leaders, the severe persecution broke out. And as a result of that persecution, 110 pastors and uh, believers were killed. Uh, 53,000 people became homeless and 750 churches were burned down and destroyed. God spoke to me directly while I was training pastors and church leaders to build a training center. Our target, our goal, our, our main ministry focus is to reach out to these 53,000 villages where people could hear the gospel. We want to take the gospel to the more difficult places and hard places. But how would we go? By ourselves, we cannot go unless we uh, have the partnership in ministry with the like-minded people who are same passion and vision for reaching to the unreached people and uh, people, those who have not heard the gospel or the name of Jesus uh, could hear and be saved and their lives could be transformed and changed completely. And also, uh, we have rescued some uh, young women who have been victim of trafficking and we are bringing here to our home here 
and uh, giving them uh, skill development training like a sewing machine. Uh, probably I would show you some of the sewing machine which have been covered here. And this is the Minati Training Center. And uh, uh, there are 13 young girls right now. And today they will be coming to uh, coming for the training program. So we give them six months training. And once they graduate, God willing, we provide them one one swing machine so that they go back to their villages and they uh, begin to stitch clothes and earn their living. So that gives them a livelihood. So we are not only providing training, skill development training, we also teach them Bible lessons. Uh, we call it portable Bible training. And uh, with that Bible lessons and Bible training, they go back to their own villages and they reach to their own people. So we don't have to go back to every villages. So that is how we can reach out to the 53,000 villages, but we need the training facilities. So we are building this training, like constructing this training center. And uh, by God's grace, uh, we have uh, come to the final stage, but uh, out of, uh, uh, $105,000 project, we have a need of $35,000 now to put the roof and do the uh, flooring and fix the door and windows. So once we are able to finish this project, we would be able to begin our training program group by group. And uh, many people from this Orissa state would come and not only from Orissa, but from other parts of India also, people will come and get the training. So we appreciate your prayers for us. Thank you so much. So that was just about four or five minutes of a, he actually, we made a 34 minute video. So I had to edit that down because I didn't think you guys wanted to be here for an extra half an hour today. But he, he just has a ton of incredible stories about um, just the way that God has called him to live out his life and share the gospel and tens of thousands of people have been reached thousands of leaders have been trained um, over the years through his ministry program and if you'd be interested in offering um, prayers or support to him you can offer financial support or sign up for their email list so that you can receive prayer updates about the ministry um, come find me after the service, and I've got an info sheet that I can give to you, and it, it shows you how you can make a donation. And if you have any questions, you can also email me at rich at aliveandgenison.org. But I just thought that was an incredible way to show you all how God is just working across our world. And something else really cool is that Alive gave their ministry through our life funds. We gave them a small donation, and they were able to use that donation to provide COVID relief for people in their neighborhood, and they, they reached 300 people that way. So that's wonderful, and they wanted to extend their thanks to you all for that donation. So that was our only announcement this morning, and as we enter into worship this morning, God gives us his grace, mercy, and his peace. From God our Father who made us, from God our Son who the Son who saved us, and from the Holy Spirit who dwells among us. Welcome to worship this morning. Will you stand with us and let's join together in singing. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one. Same 
for he alone is strong enough to say rise your shackles are no more for jesus christ has broken every chain i will call upon the lord for he alone is strong enough to pray together. Father God, we will extol you at all times. Your praise will always be on our lips. We will take glory in the Lord. Let all the afflicted hear and rejoice, and we glorify you, Lord. Together we exalt your name. We long for you, O Lord. Answer us. Deliver us from all our fears, and may all of our faces never be covered with shame. We call on you, Our Lord, hear us, save us out of our trouble, and send your angels to encamp around us and deliver us. We know, Lord, that you are good. You are our only refuge. We are your people, and even when we're weary and hungry, we can seek you, for in you we lack no good thing. Accept our worship today. Bless us today. And hear us today in Jesus' name. Amen. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun says free oh it's free There's a place 
God says you are. That's what matters, amen? It's really all that matters. Today we're here to worship him, and uh, he longs for you to know the affection in his heart for you. Pray with me. Father God, we are chosen and not forsaken. You are for us and not against us. We are set free, children of the Most High God, with a place set for us in our Father's house. Yes, I am. Yes, we are. This is all that matters. It powers my life every day. So by your spirit this morning, open our hearts as we open your word. Be our teacher today and bless your word to accomplish its purposes in our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to be seated for just a little while, maybe a couple little whiles. <laughs> So there will be an address on the screen here in a second, 2 Corinthians 5. Let me get rid of some of these notifications here a minute so I can read what's actually going on here. 2 Corinthians 5 is, uh, is where we're going to be today, and uh, we'll be in a couple other places as well, but uh, that'll be the heart uh, for our teaching text this morning. And as you find that place, whether you're here and you're opening your scripture or getting online or whether you are online and you're sitting in your own living room or family room or maybe even the garage mahal and all of your friends are over sitting outside, it's a beautiful day to do that. Today, uh, I invite you to be ready, to be ready to hear what God says to you, to be ready to take some notes, uh, to be ready to open your imagination to the images that the scripture uses. I love, uh, especially the way Jesus teaches, he often paints a picture for us so that we understand, or he walks up to a tree, and he says, pay attention to it, or to a grapevine, and he teaches us how the Father who owns the garden is the one who prunes. And so today, there's an image for us too. So open your imaginations for just a moment, and imagine how glorious heaven will be. Imagine, there's a big a blank canvas ready to be painted on. Imagine as that picture gets drawn, as that painting gets painted, and the color and the dimension and the focus is added. Imagine how glorious heaven will be. What are some of those things that come to mind? Let's put a couple of adjectives in the air this morning. Adjectives of worship. How glorious will heaven be? What do you think? It'll be quiet, okay? <laughs> there might be crickets. Now, come on, let's have this conversation. As you imagine how glorious heaven will be, what are some of those things that come to mind? Let's start in this section. Give me a word or a phrase. Glorious, glorious. yeah. Worship. worship. And I'm ready to worship unhindered. You? Ha <laughs> ha, here we go. Incomprehensible. I don't even know what that word means. No, ha <laughs> ha. 
Sorry, a little, little pun there, you know. Uh, it is. It's beyond our imagination, right? I mean, even the relationship of prayer is beyond what we can ask or imagine. We don't even know. I remember one of the first sermons uh, that I taught. I was 14 years old, <laughs> and I brought a five-gallon bucket with me. It wasn't from Lowe's. I don't even know if Lowe's existed back then in 1403. But uh, I brought a five-gallon bucket, and I asked the same question. I said, what do you think the glory of heaven will be? And I held up a marble. And we began to put adjectives to that marble. I'll tell you in a second what I did with it. So this section here, back here, what are some of the words of the glory of heaven? What can you imagine? Beautiful. What else? Fun. You know, I like that. I wonder if Jesus had fun. I bet he did. I bet he told puns. <laughs> I bet he did. I bet he laughed. Uh-huh, yeah. I think sometimes we think he's all serious. And he is, because he's God. <laughs> but he also invented fun and smiles and laughter and jokes and the intellectual capacity to turn a phrase so that someone laughs. He invented all those things. How about you guys? What, give me a word of glory. Say it again. Singing? Dancing. Yeah. Almost like a wedding. <laughs> yeah? What else? This section. One more, one more word. Sunny. 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 Yes. A lot like... Michigan, only different. <laughs> we can't end on that one. We could, but one more. There was a word over here. Color. Oh. I think in like 50 years of walking around, no one has ad added that adjective. I like that. Yeah, it's good. So I took that marble that I held in the air, and from this distance, I dropped it into that five-gallon bucket. And it made that noise, and then I rolled it around on the bottom, and I said, how much more room is there in that bucket for things that we can't even imagine? There's that much more glory that you and I can't even see, that we can't even imagine or begin to understand. Begin to paint that picture this morning. And it's one of those living room size pictures, right? Like bigger than you would put on the wall behind your sofa, bigger than the TV that you have in your family room, and unless you're sporting an 82. Then it's about that size, right? Imagine that this painting is coming to life. Here's the way Scripture begins to put the brush to the canvas. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7, the words are on the screen the scripture writer John receives this revelation. He writes it down for us, and here's what he wrote. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. In just those two verses, the word new shows up for us three times. It means fresh, unused. It's the ultimate quality and unlimited opportunity, the unimaginable, incomprehensible glory set before us. That's what John was able to see. He didn't have enough words, enough adjectives to describe the glory that he saw in that vision. So that's what he saw. Verse three, here's what he heard. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. Put some theology to that sentence, right? I mean, God is the God of heaven. God is invisible. God is spirit, and no one has ever seen him. And now the dwelling of God is with people. Isn't that our goal? Isn't that our future? To be in his presence and to see our Lord with our eyes, John is beginning to hear this story. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. This was the heart and passion of every Jewish believer, and now us who are Gentiles are called and invited to have this same passion, to want nothing more than to have our dwelling with God. Verse 3 continues, and they'll be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. That's our goal, to be in his presence, to dwell with him in glory. No sin between us. The place for me is set at his banquet table. 
in that great wedding feast where the bridegroom enters the chamber and we are prepared for that glory. What an amazing vision. Verse 4, so in that place, look at what God does. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That word, the old order, has passed away simply means that what was first, what God was doing, will be done. Verse 5, he who was seated on the throne now speaks. And he says, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And say amen if you're glad that John wrote these things down so we could read them this morning. Come on. This is for us. This is the glory that we attach our heartstrings to because it pulls us forward, it moves us forward. Verse 6, and then almost like you were seated right next to each other, almost like the God of the revelation speaks quietly. Maybe it's a declaration to the masses. Maybe it's a whisper to your heart this morning. He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I'll give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And those who are victorious, they will inherit all this. And I'll be their God and they'll be my children. Isn't that our goal? Is to dwell with him eternally in glory? That's the sophisized painting. That's the thing that God is showing us this morning. That's the thing I want your imagination to begin to see a vision of. The old order of things passing away where sin no longer is our master. Our flesh no longer rules our lives. Unless we give it that authority. Unless we say, okay, come on, back in, get in the driver's seat, I'll scooch over. Uh, My first vehicle was a 1965 Chevy pickup, C10, regular cab, long bed, wood stake on the bottom. It was wonderful, but it had one of those vinyl bench seats, three on the tree, and if you had someone riding with you and you did the corner just right after you put armor all on that seat, whoop, (laughs) they'd be against the door. It's that kind of a thing. Sometimes, do you ever armor all the seat in your car and you scoot over and you let the old life take over? In a minute, we'll see that we all do, once in a while. But the one seated said, the old order has passed away and sin no longer is your master. You see, he's making everything new. In, in the Greek scriptures, this is the present active tense. It means he is currently busy doing that. In John's revelation, Christ is busy at work, making all things new, all things new. Heaven and earth and God dwelling with us, no more death or tears or mourning or crying or pain. Like the first creation, this new creation is going to come out of chaos. All that struggle and trouble that we know and experience and feel today in our world and in our hearts will be done. And out of that place, out of that void, God will bring order filling that void with glory for shame, healing for disease, and peace for trouble. I feel that I'm talking a little bit loud because I get excited about this kind of stuff because it's what we sing about, right? We sing about that peace. We sing about how the glory will um, displace the shame in our lives. And those songs, they come not out of just nowhere. They come out of the scripture, out of the passion that those who long to and have seen a vision and know a revelation from God, they begin to attach their heart there. And on that day, listen, on that day, the fullness of God's purposes will be known. We will literally stand in his presence. Our faith will be fulfilled. Our hope will be realized. His glory will flood every inch of his creation and we'll finally know him. And and Paul, was it your word, worship? And we will worship him like we were created to be. That's coming. 
Every inch of his creation will know him and worship him and walk with him in the ways in which we were created to. So here's the deal. Um, I've walked around the block a couple of times, not literally this block, just metaphorically. I think it takes some age and perspective to begin to see this painting to see that revelation more clearly, to long for it more continually. And it's usually not till you figure out the temporariness of this life that you can begin to see. I've had the incredible privilege to stand by a lot of bedsides when people were being translated from this life into glory. And before that, to walk with them where they began to untie their heart from the things of this life and they realize the stuff in their closet doesn't matter. They realize that the home and the car that they've purchased and built, it doesn't matter. That all of the things that consume us, that we spend our resources on, Scripture gives us perspective on, right? Moth uh, corrupts and rust takes it away, and, or the thief comes in and steals it. And it's not until you get that perspective that this is just temporary that you begin to see the painting. And I have to confess, and and maybe it's a little selfish, but I think gray hair helps see the picture. I think when you've been around the block a little bit, I mean, my priorities have changed since I was six. When I was 16, I used to wash my truck four times a week. True story. Now it's five. No, (laughs) now it's way less. The floor mats in my truck right now are muddy and full of gravel. That would have never happened when I was 16. Never. I had an ashtray in my truck. When you would pull it forward, I actually had a little piece of rabbit fur lining the bottom of it because it was like rusty and dirty and that kind of stuff. And it was full of strawberry peppermints. (laughs) Lifesavers. You know those individually wrapped? They called me the strawberry kid. Well, that's not true. I wanted them to call me the strawberry kid. There's some of that stuff I don't care about anymore. You? I mean, I don't think I'm just talking into the air. I think I'm talking to some people who are getting a perspective, who are seeing a picture. Usually when you figure out the temporariness of life, and sometimes that comes with gray hair, what it does is it turns your values right side up. Come on. And we start longing for glory more than this. Because this isn't much. I live in Hudsonville. Of all the places in the world, I chose to live, not even in Hudsonville. I live in some township by Hudsonville. I won't say it because people are in line. Georgetown. Um, I love living here. It ain't the most beautiful place I've ever been. (laughs) I live in a two-bedroom ranch. (laughs) It's 40-some years old. It has holes in it. Every generation has a song to help them learn and remember that we are looking forward. We are moving forward. We're a forward-moving people, right? If you're not moving forward, if you're just standing still, I forget how the rest of that line goes, but there's not progress, right? In fact, you're going backwards because everybody else is moving forward. Every generation has a song to help them learn and remember that we're moving forward. This morning, my prayer was from Psalms, uh, I think it was 34. This is from Psalm 73, 25. You know these words. Nothing I desire compares to you. For centuries, millennia, this has been the song of the believer. We sing, I've searched the world over, and I don't know exactly how the tune goes. It's from Graves to Gardens. I've searched the world over, and nothing is better than you. Every generation has its song. Helen Lemmel, she wrote in 1922, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's give it a try. That ending part of that line. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the in the light of his glory and grace, then the things of this earth will start to grow dim. The painting gets brighter. It gets spotlights added to it the longer that it hangs in our spiritual living rooms. Come on, I'm getting excited. I'm gonna invite you to hold on to that picture. Hold on to that picture of what God will do and don't ever forget it. Don't ever lose it because it's not done yet. We're not done yet. Is anybody else perfect in the room? Nobody? Yeah, me neither. 
Not done yet. He's currently making it all new. It's not done. It's not all new yet. You know this truth because you can feel it. That longing for what we don't have yet. The perfect glory. You see, that's the reality, is there is newness that's not yet complete. His work is done, but it's not yet fully installed. Christ is at work, and we live in between what is and what will be. It's called the already and the not yet, and they're both true. We long for that glory. We long for the new creation, a new body, a pure heart, a pain-free life, and we're learning to live with the hope for that glory at the same time as our brokenness for today. They coexist in here. It's a journey, it's really a process, a process of change. In the church world, it's called transformation. It's a process of, of longing and living. We long for that glory, that new creation, and that process of figuring out how to be both, of already being justified, of Christ already taking care of our guilt and shame. It's all paid for. Death, which is the last enemy, is already conquered. Our inheritance is set in heaven, and the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives in you is a deposit guaranteeing that inheritance. All those things are true. We are already justified in Jesus Christ, and at the same time, we're in the process of being sanctified. It means being purified and, and cleaned up and being set free from sin. All that stuff that we talked about last week that wants to grab hold of you and steal, kill, and destroy you, of being set free from that. But it's a journey, and it's one of these journeys where it's like, oh, I'm free. Oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, I'm free. Oh, I'm in trouble. It's one of those. It's that kind of life. 2 Corinthians 5.1, it's on the screen. You see, we're not the first ones to be here. The, the first church, New Testament church in Corinth was learning this exact same thing, that in Jesus Christ they're already justified, but, but the reality is we're not yet complete. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5.1, this is our text for this morning, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Notice how it's both. We live in this temporary tent, but we have this mansion in glory. So we have this longing from our position, a looking forward from where we are, and both things are true at the same time. Verse, uh, the next words help us. Hang on just a second. Verse 2. But meanwhile, we groan. We groan longing. The word meanwhile in, uh, uh, in linguistic terms, it's a connector word, connecting what precedes to what follows. And that's us. We're connected. We're in the in-between. We have our feet in, what, what is it in that place in the United States? Four corners where you can be in four states at one time? Yeah, yeah, that's this. <clears throat> meanwhile, we we groan, longing uh, to strain, to have affection, it, to have the ache while you wait. That's that longing word right there. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we'll not be found naked, we'll, we'll not be vulnerable, we'll not be without comfort or defense. <clears throat> I'm going to take another water break. Hang on. You guys good? I can talk more. Can you listen more? Say yes if you can. That was less than a third of you. <laughs> That's okay. Not having a listener has never stopped me from talking. Here we go. Verse 4. For while we're in this tent, we groan at our burdens. Can anybody identify? Come on. Because we don't wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal... What's temporary has an end, has a limited purpose, a shelf life that's shorter than we think. I lost my place. So that's what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Aren't you glad it didn't say death? Life. We want to be done with our weakness. We do. We want that glory. We want that life. And if you do, if you feel that ache and it makes a longing for you for a relationship with God, it simply means you want God. And you want him in your life, and you can't wait to be more full of his glory and to be set free from this stuff. 
And I'm not just talking about setting free from this earth and then moving on to eternal life. I mean being set free from the stuff that so easily entangles today. It's both. Verse 5, now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose, our glory, is God. But he's taking care of us in the in-between, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing, listen close, what is to come. Guaranteeing what is to come. This is reality, but it's not all of our reality. Does that make sense? There's a part of me you can't see. There's a handsome glory that's going to show up someday. And you'll go, oh man, you're way better than I thought you were. The reality is that we're uncomfortable. God's doing something new. He's creating something new. He's making us new, resurrecting us from the reign and rule of sin, but we're still here in this tent. And every Jewish person who heard this They remembered the desert and the tents and the tabernacles and the temporariness of journeying, waiting for the promised land. By the Holy Spirit, we're already full of life, God's life, his purpose and his direction. We're already filled with hope and glory, but we struggle in this life. It's like we're running towards God full speed, but something keeps grabbing our ankles. Have you ever had that dream? I have that dream once in a while. Can never get away. The scripture says the sin that so easily entangles. In another place, the scripture says the weakness that makes us so weary. I was talking with someone last week, and they were impressed by the Spirit of God that this is not a sprint that you and I are in. It's not like, there he is, done. This is a marathon. And there are water breaks in marathon. I'm glad today's a good water break. You see, we're living in a duality. Our salvation, our righteousness, and our eternal glory is secure. It's an inheritance that no one can take away, but we're carrying it around in a paper box. An inglorious, broken, torn, soaked, and soggy box. In the first manuscript, I wrote the word saggy, but I thought that was a little too descriptive. Here's the bottom line. Of all the things that Christ finished by his perfect life, death, and, re- death and resurrection, he's still working on us. We're already justified, but we're still being sanctified and transformed. I think the correct seminary term here is God is working on our inside-outness. I don't know, maybe I made that up, but think about it, your inside-outness. It shows up in stages, right? And I think it starts on the inside. The tent will be done someday, but I already have a new heart. Amen? Inside outness. You see, he calls us, he justifies us by choosing us in Christ and glorifies us, transforming this inglorious person into a new creation full of his glory, all for his glory. It shows up in stages because that's how he paints, stretches the canvas. And on Good Friday, he stretched it wide with his love. And he attaches the first color, the base color. And then he's all set to add the glorious color. You see, it's kind of like this. He makes the first move. He knows us. He chooses us. He resurrects us by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ, by the power of the gospel. So he opens our closed hearts. He softens our hard hearts. He resurrects our intellect and our will the way we think and believe, our hearts and our minds, our passions and desires, and he bends it back toward himself. Like some, uh, what do you call it, Randy? Is it, oh, he's sleeping. Is it, uh, is it rebar? You know, when you're pouring a wall, the re- so you know, if that's not quite right, you can bend it because you want the walls. God takes our will and he bends it back towards himself. actually got that image from the Canons of Dort. Believe it or not, the third and fourth head of doctrine, which teaches us how the heart of a human is regenerated for God's glory. Articles 13, 14, 15, and 16. Article somewhere in there is one of my favorites because it says we don't really know how God does these things. (laughs) But he does. 
so that instead of being disinclined towards God, leaning and running away, we lean in and we begin to want him and everything that he is and the glory is what we long for. So he resurrects our sin-dead hearts so that we can know him and believe in him and love him and serve him. And we learn to love him and his son. And we begin to want the Holy Spirit to direct our lives because we love him. We're changed and transformed by the power of his love. And because of his love in us, we now live for him. More on that next week. Don't miss it. Be here. Be a part of it next week. We're going to dig deep into that thought. Here's that quote I was just talking about from the third and fourth head of doctrine about how God regenerates us. We cannot fully understand the way that this happens, but all the while we're held together with peace, knowing and experiencing that by the grace of God, we believe with all our hearts and love our Savior while we wait for his work in us to be complete. Who knew they were so smart back then? You see, we have both glory and trouble love and disobedience and every day we get to choose what to attach our hearts to we know what jesus said about what we love where our treasure is we love that thing the most that's where our hearts will be what does your painting look like today as you live in the middle what do you desire most what's your treasure we used to say, <clears throat> uh, show me your checkbook register and I'll show you your priorities, your values, and what you desire most, but nobody keeps a checkbook register anymore, right? Now it's QuickBooks or something or, I don't know, some app from PNC that tells you what's up. Um, maybe it's just the movie, show me the money! I, um, anyway, the way you spend your resources helps you understand the data points of what your heart is attached to. Our priorities, our values, what we desire most, those are the data points. If you looked at the evidence of my life, well, let's do it this way. If you looked at the evidence of your life, your passions and priorities, the way you spend your time, your money, your energy, the, what you think about the most, what would the evidence say your first love really is? I've been in discipleship groups where we actually talk about that stuff, and it changes your life. I've been in men's ministries for a lot of years, and we do the five-point checkup. It's called a five-minute checkup, but it's how are your eyes? What are you looking at? How's your mind? What do you think about the most? How's your heart? What do you love? And how are your hands? How do you serve? And if you looked at the trajectory of your feet, are they fitted with a piece of the gospel and are you headed to where God is at work? And so we have to take turns sitting in a chair and we have to answer those questions to the other men in the half circle. I hate sitting in that chair. Because you've got to be honest. What do the data points of evidence say about your first love? If you're not happy with a balance in your account when you answer that question, I want you to know this, that gaining glory is a lifelong process. It helps to know these things. It makes the difference when you know that, that you're not done yet. If you have a negative balance in that account, didn't we just sing, what was the one song? There you are, standing up holding the baby, about um, he loves us first, right? That even, I don't know the words, but even before, he loves us first. Even if you have a negative balance, he loved you first. Gaining glory is a lifelong process. Imagine if we understood that all Christ did is complete and sufficient, that all his blessings to me are secure and nothing can change that. It's rock solid and for sure. And at the same time, I'm broken. My flesh is weak. Uh, sometimes it prevails and uh, I slip up. And even then, I don't lose everything. Even when you mess up, you don't lose your inheritance. Amen? It's got to be true. Because if it depends on me whether I'm saved, I'm in trouble. But if it depends on Jesus, ha <laughs> he's already victorious. That's rock solid. Imagine the Teflon that that is for the devil's accusations. It's, I don't know, the Bible might say it's like a shield of faith against his flaming arrows. 
Imagine how hard we would fight against those things that cause his glory to leak out of our lives or his image to fade in us. Imagine how much my heart would ache if I knew how much my brokenness harms the heart of God. I would never intentionally go to his studio and mess up his painting. I wouldn't. What if I longed for the art of his transforming work on the canvas of my life? What if I valued myself as much as he values me? Would that help us to be more strong and get back into the fight against the sin in us? I bet it would. I mean, don't you just, listen, don't you just long for the red paint of the love of the Son of God to cover your canvas? (laughs) Maybe it's a picture of the Passover. I don't know. But if we could begin to see ourselves and others differently, instead of defining people on what we see and what they do today and now, I mean, what would change if we would know people the way that God knows them, if we would see people the way that God sees them as holy and dearly loved? A painting already complete in the heart of God, but still being painted. A a, a recipe with all the ingredients measured out. That's how I like to cook. Usually everything's all measured out already, and then I can just go after it and All the little spices are in the cups and everything's already, you know, like a sous chef, you know, everything's cut and prepared and ready to slide into the wok. I love cooking in a wok. Measure everything out, but it's not yet done baking in the oven of God's work, which, by the way, is a purifying fire. Here's how Paul says it. I don't know, how many pages do I have left? Not many. (laughs) 1057. Follow me into the way that Paul says it here. Quick a minute, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. We're still in 2 Corinthians 5, but now verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we even regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. They saw him as temporary and weak and just a man, and because he wasn't going to be the military Messiah that they wanted, they offed him. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, listen, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The new creation, just like the first one, founded out of nothing. Nothing I've done. It's all God's work. The old is gone. The new is here. It means to emerge from one realm to another. Our inclination and purpose and the trajectory of our heart is all new. It's bent back towards God, which gives me a new ownership, a new future, and a new life Our identity is absolutely defined by whose name is on it. And I'm a child of God. I wrote this line. It makes no sense, but I wrote, dun, 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 dun. Listen. (laughs) Does it? Literally says that here. D-U-D-U-D-U-D-A-A-A. Dot, 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 listen. Dun, 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 listen. Because we're near the end. (laughs) So don't fade away yet. Breathe in. From now on, we don't regard people from what we know or what we think we know or what we hear and what we think we understand. The way we regard people is we trust God's word and his work, what he says, what he does. We trust his Holy Spirit. He trusts his Holy Spirit. God knows that the Spirit will succeed at his work and all things, including each of us, will be made brand new and God never fails, amen? And we don't know how long he's going to take. Remember that movie? Oh, man, I think it was a Bruce Willis movie a long time ago. I see Dutch people. Maybe I got it wrong. Well, I see new people. Your word was color? I see new people painted in red. Covered by the blood of the Lamb. And we can start seeing people and others and even ourselves the way God sees us and what will be. And it will change our point of view. And instead of piling up mistakes and seeing a rap sheet, we can look through the lens of what God is making of that person. And it will change the way that we do church and mission and worship. And when we're sitting in the chair in our five-minute checkup, it will change the way we confess because we trust what God will do with that. He'll take the guilt. He'll cover the shame. You'll be done with it. And he will set you on a new trajectory. He'll pick you up and set you on your feet again. That's what he does. We can change our point of view. We can look through the lens of what God is doing. It changes even the way that we see Jesus. 
Remember, they thought he was a blasphemer and a liar, and he wasn't. So let's get uber practical. This will be it. It's 1101. We got to be done. Well, we don't got to be, but, you know. Remember what we said last week? Our past sins don't define us. I want you to know that the stains that they left don't define us. Our brokenness does not define us. Our world likes it that way, though. They love to label us, to find the one thing that makes a person different, different from them anyway, and then define that whole person and their heart and their future by that one thing. And they give us a new name. Well, it's not the new name that God has given us, amen? People may want to define us by our scars, but in Jesus we instead have new life. But that's the thing about scars, is they remain. Jesus still has scars. Did you know that? He showed them to his disciples. See, put put your finger here, where the nail was. Put your hand in my side. Those are my scars. That was my guilt. And he uses it to remind his disciples of his grace. But he also has glory. And he never fails. He's the risen and victorious Lord. And the work that he began in you, the painting of your life, will absolutely be carried out to completion. That's scripture. It's our future that defines our today because the Lord of today is the God of tomorrow. Our hope of the things unseen, the things that Jesus has told us about, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to guarantee that they will come to be. What we are is not what we will be, not what we will become. And God knows what he's doing. He knows his success rate is 100%. So he defines you based on his work, not ours, not when we're unfaithful and not even when we're faithful. He defines us according to his son. His righteousness is already ours. He's working on the rest of it, that process of being made pure. And sometimes it's just a foot washing. Sometimes it's all you need is a quick dip and move on. Sometimes (laughs) it's an entire bath. For some of us in this room today, it's a complete overhaul in the potter's house, remolded and reshaped after his will. And guess what? Here's the most fun part. We don't have to figure out how he's going to do that. In fact, we can't. We can't know how he'll do it, how he'll regenerate our hearts. The plan, the practice, uh, the pace, the priority, it's all up to him. He decides what gets new first. He does. He decides how to shape you and call you and ordain your days because it's his painting. It's not ours. And if only he knows, if you don't know, uh, then I don't know either. So guess what? I'm free from controlling or manipulating you. (laughs) It's not up to me. I just get to love you, and I get to love God, and together we'll follow him and do his work. And the funny thing is, he doesn't call and consult with any of us to see if his ideas are amenable. He just does it. This is the coolest part about discipleship. One little bit at a time on a journey where God's in charge, the objectives and goals, the plan and the pace, the revelations. We just partner with God and help the other person stay on the journey. Because staying in the journey, staying in the current of God's grace is really hard. Because transformation, even from uh, whatever it is to glory, is hard because it hurts when things change. When things get ripped out that we're accustomed to, even the things that are bad and the things that are good, when it's ripped off like a Band-Aid that's already stuck to the sore. That's gross. (laughs) Conflict is inherent, this side of glory. Let's just end here. Conflict is inherent, and it's confusing. It's confusing that when we struggle and are uncomfortable, we wonder, how can this be a part of God's plan? Isn't he the God of comfort? Isn't he the thing that puts it all the pieces back together? And so somehow that tension in living with a hope of glory and the reality of brokenness is something we want to avoid. We are pain averse. Think about it. Do you know anyone who's trying to escape conflict and trouble right now or having difficulty hanging in with someone else who's struggling or not engaging the pain and suffering for the sake of the gospel? I mean, people tend to pursue the comfort of their preference more than engage the ache of brokenness. And we may have forgotten, like Job's friend, how how to sit a long time in the silent suffering with brokenness. 
We've so longed for our glory of our future inheritance that we have forgotten the glory of daily obedience. We actually get stronger when we fight against sin and engage suffering. We've chosen sides in order to be seen as right and not wrong, but we may have forgotten that's what's really wrong is our hearts, right? If we only have the perspective of the glory that will be ours, we miss the purposes of God's calling for us today to mourn with those who mourn and suffer with Christ for the sake of the kingdom. Because the God of the mountain, finish it for me, is the God of the valley. It was his choice to save us and leave us here, not mine. To learn to love him more than ourselves, more than our own lives, and to love others the way that he loves us. So you're still here and you're still broken. And as his glory is poured in, even as it displaces the old me and the old you and the new is coming to be and that glory leaks out, he fills it up again. You see, we're just earthen vessels, jars of clay, fragile, temporary tents, prone to struggle with ungodliness. But in that jar of clay, God puts his treasure. So today, the good news is that even if you're the weakest person in the room, a vessel that's cracked and pieces are missing, God has chosen you to be fit and holy to hold his glory. So I invite you to put the painting of his glory in the living room of your heart, to hang it over top of all the paintings of your brokenness, to let his glory cover all your stories and sins, all of them, no matter how many, no matter how big, because he has a perfect plan and he has more than enough red paint. You see the nails that the picture of his glory hang upon are strong enough to carry it all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, praise be to you. In your great mercy, you have given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, you have given us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and is kept in heaven for us. By faith, we are shielded by your power until the coming of that salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. So in all of this stuff, we greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, we suffer all kinds of grief and all kinds of trials. But they prove the genuineness of our faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. May it all result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus, when you're revealed, though we haven't seen you, we love you. And even though we don't see you today, we believe in you and we're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for we are receiving the end result of our faith, the salvation of our souls. So bless us, Lord Jesus. Help us to bless you and to love you and to love others as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray all this. Amen. Will you stand with us and let's close together in singing.
You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Let's sing that again. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running. so so good with every breath that i am able i will see of the goodness of god and all my life you have been I just want to thank you for hanging in there. Uh, this morning I cut a page and a half out of that manuscript. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Woo, me too. Somehow that, that message just got laid on my heart that, that this is what God wants us to know. <laughs> that living in the middle are really, really hard sometimes. But he wants you to know that you're his child and he's put his name on you and nothing can change that. And that someday he's coming for you. <laughs> So if, uh, if you must flee, free from the, flee from the sin that so easily entangles and instead draw near to God. And if you must run, run to those who need you and help them up, arm in arm, run with them. And each of us, we know that we have a race marked out for us clearly, a course designed by God for his purposes. And as your canvas is covered by his grace and glory today, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may he lift up his face and look right at you and grant you his peace. Amen. If you're able, join us for coffee on the front lawn. Mm -hmm.